Greetings, fellow mathematicians. Have you ever wondered how to find the factorial for a non-integer value? Well, we're going to learn how to do that by introducing the gamma function. Now, let's start with some motivation for why you would want to arrive at this thing called the gamma function. And let's go to some basic factorial values here for positive integers. We have them from 0 going up to 5 factorial, and they grow rather quickly. Now, if we plot them on our coordinate system here, we have on the x-axis the value for n, y-axis n factorial, we get these set of points. Now, this is the factorial for integer values, and what we want to do is basically interpolate, in other words, fit a curve to all these data points, a continuous curve. Now, we can draw that here. We have the value of 0 factorial, which is 1, and then 1 factorial, which is 1, Looks like it dips down and then goes back up. So let's go ahead and draw what this might look like. And we get something like that. And what we're going to try to do is find the equation here as a function of x. So what is the function of x that gives you that continuous graph what we might call the continuous factorial versus here, the normal factorial, that's a discrete factorial. Well, we're going to kind of generalize this basic property of factorials. The iterative property, n plus 1 factorial is n plus 1 times n factorial. You could rewrite that here instead as n factorial equals n times n minus 1 factorial. And we're going to see if we can find a function that has this property built into it. So at this point, there's really nothing left to do, but let's introduce the gamma function. And it is defined as an improper integral. Now I'm going to write it in the standard version, which uses z, a complex variable, but we're not going to go into detail about how this involves complex numbers because that's way beyond the scope of what we're going to aim for this video. So let's just write it down, what we're going to call gamma of z. And this is defined as an improper integral from 0 to infinity. And then it involves two parts. We have t to the z minus 1, where z is your input variable, and then it's being multiplied by e to the negative t, and then we integrate that over t. And that is the gamma function. Now, this definition as an improper integral, it is not obvious how it generalizes this property, but we'll be getting to that a little bit later. So let's go ahead and start with some basic values that we can plug in. Let's go ahead first and plug in 1. And notice where your input variable z is up there in the exponent of t. So if we plug in z as 1, you get t to the 1 minus 1, t to the 0, times e to the negative t. And t to the 0 is 1, so this just simplifies to the improper integral from 0 to infinity. of e to the negative t. And from your Calculus 2 course, you probably actually did this as a problem at some point. This evaluates to 1. So we get a value here, the gamma function of 1 equals 1. Let's go to now plugging in 2. So we're going to evaluate the gamma function of 2. Notice we're going to plug in now z is 2. We'll get t to the 2 minus 1, or just t to the 1. So we get an integral here from 0 to infinity of t to the 1 times e to the negative t. And this one you can evaluate with a straightforward integration by parts just once, and you'll find you again get the value 1. So go through that, integrate that by parts, set it up appropriately as an improper integral, and you'll get the value 1 there. Now, what we want to arrive at next is the value, we're going to go up to gamma of 3, 
and this is going to be the improper integral from zero to infinity. Now when z is three, we're going to get t squared, t to the three minus one, And that requires a little bit more work. And while we're at it, let's go ahead and simultaneously also do the value for gamma of four. So that's where you're gonna be plugging in z as four. We're gonna get t to the three, or t to the four minus one. And we're gonna go ahead and evaluate these very quickly with the shortcut for integration by parts known as the tabular method. So let's go ahead and get to that right now. First up, gamma of three. So we have the improper integral of t squared times e to the negative t. And we're gonna go through this by integrating by parts a few times. And we're gonna do it using the tabular method. So let's set this up. We have a column for the signs, column for u, and a column for dv. Start it with a plus, choose u as you would normally, t squared, and dv, e to the negative t. So we're gonna repeatedly differentiate, two t, two, and then zero, and then the other column we repeatedly integrate. So negative e to the negative t, positive e to the negative t, and then negative e to the negative t. All right, alternate your signs, plus, negative, plus, negative, and then we do the product of the signed diagonals. These are your uv terms. All right, and if we go ahead and multiply, notice everything has a factor of e to the negative t, and even more, Notice all of them have a factor of negative one. So let's factor out a negative and e to the negative t. And what we're left with is t squared plus two t and then plus two. And that's all times e to the negative t. We need to evaluate this from t equals zero to t equals infinity, which we're gonna be technically doing that as a limit as t approaches infinity. So if you first evaluate it at infinity, take a limit of that antiderivative as t goes to infinity, you can apply L'Hopital's rule and due to the decreasing exponential, that whole part goes to zero. All right, now we subtract and we plug in the lower limit and the only thing that's gonna survive when we plug in t equal to zero, t squared is zero, two t is zero, we're gonna have two, we have a negative, and then e to the zero is one. So we're just left with negative two, and that evaluates to two, which we're thinking of that as two factorial. So we get the value here of gamma of three. Now for the other value here that we're gonna find, gamma of four, that's just a little bit more work with the tabular method, but let's go through that anyway. So we're gonna pretty much do the same calculation. Set this up again, pretty much identical. Make your same choice for u, which is now gonna be t cubed dv is still e to the negative t. And same as before, we're gonna repeatedly differentiate the u column to get three t squared. You can probably see where the factorial is gonna come from now. We're gonna get now three times two, six t, six, and then the derivative of six is zero. And again, we repeatedly integrate the dv column. So we get negative, e to the negative t, e to the negative t, negative e to the negative t, and then e to the negative t. Don't forget to alternate your signs. Always start with a plus, minus, plus, minus, plus. 
and then take your product of the signed diagonals. Virtually identical over here from when we evaluated gamma of three, just with an extra step of integration by parts, an extra kind of column there or row. All right, so same thing as before. Notice everything has an exponential factor. All the terms there have a negative. So let me factor out a negative and the exponential. So our first term in parentheses should be t cubed. Next one should be 3t squared. All right, next one should be 6t. And then your last term would be plus 6. That's all being multiplied by e to the negative t. We factor that out. And like before, we evaluate that from t equals 0. to t equals infinity, which we're going to be taking a limit for that as t approaches infinity. Same as before, as t approaches infinity, the negative exponential, the decreasing exponential goes to zero. And we subtract now. When we plug in t equals zero, the only thing that's going to remain is the negative. And inside the parentheses, only thing left would be the six. And if you simplify that, you get positive six, which we're gonna think of as three factorial. So we get the value here for gamma of four, which is three factorial or six. All right, let's take these values and put them back in the work where we left off. Let's go ahead and put those values for gamma of three and gamma of four back we found that they come out to two factorial or two and three factorial six respectively. Now we did that by integrating by parts several times using the tabular method. And you can pretty much do the same thing to get gamma of five, but now you have t to the fourth. It's a little bit more work with integrating by parts, a few more steps, but you'll find this comes out to four factorial. which is 24. Now, from these values, we can probably observe a pattern. It seems as if gamma of an integer is the previous factorial. Notice gamma of three, two factorial, gamma of four, three factorial, gamma of five, four factorial. So it seems like we can generalize this to the gamma function of an integer n it should be the previous integer, n minus one, it's factorial. And that is basically how we relate the gamma function to the main property of factorials. All right, so let's go ahead and get to some more properties for this. We're gonna switch this around and see a more useful version to answer the question of how we define a factorial for non-integer values. From the previous work on evaluating factorials, we arrived at this property. The gamma function of an integer is the previous integer's factorial, or in other words, the gamma function of n equals n minus one factorial, where n is a positive integer. Now we're gonna shift this in other words, replace here n everywhere in that statement with n plus one, and we get this slightly cleaner looking version, the gamma function of n plus one equals n factorial. n plus one minus one cancels to n there. Now, how we're going to relate this property for factorials to the gamma function, let's just switch that around, just switching left and right sides, and let's rewrite this as n factorial equals the gamma function of n plus one. And here, n is a positive integer. Now, this is how we're gonna extend the factorial to non-integer values. We're basically just going to replace here n, which is a positive integer. Symbolically, we're gonna replace it with the complex variable z. And what we get here 
is z factorial, we can define this as the gamma function of z plus 1. And since we have an improper integral representation for the gamma function, just replace z with z plus 1. Up there for the power of t, you'll get z plus 1 minus 1. And we can define z factorial for any non-integer value as the improper integral from 0 to infinity of t to the z times e to the negative t. And we integrate that uh, over t from 0 to infinity. All right, and again, this is going to be how we extend the factorial from integer values, positive integer values, to non-integer values. Now, the real property for the gamma function we're going to see from earlier generalizes this. n factorial is n times n minus 1 factorial. Now, since we have this generalization for the factorial to non-integer values, it seems like we should be able to generalize this. Notice we're going to replace n factorial with z factorial, but z factorial, we properly define that as the gamma function of z plus 1. All right, and just replace all other n's with z. And here you would get z minus 1 factorial, which is the gamma function of z. And this is not a proof, but by generalizing this property of factorials, it seems like this should be true. Well, we're left asking, Is that actually true? In other words, does the gamma function of z plus 1 satisfy this property? The gamma function of z plus 1 equals z times the gamma function of z. Well, to answer that, we're going to go through a proof using integration by parts. So let's go ahead and do that. And we're basically just going to go to our improper integral definition for the gamma function of z plus 1. And that is the integral from 0 to infinity of t to the z times e to the negative t dt. We're going to integrate by parts, choosing u. As t to the z and dv as e to the negative t. Technically here, z can be thought of as a complex variable, but we're just going to treat it as a normal number. So go ahead and differentiate that power of t. Apply the power rule, bring z down. And then subtract 1 from the exponent. All right, and same as before, we're going to find v by calculating an antiderivative, and that comes out to negative e to the negative t. We go ahead and apply the integration by parts formula. We have uv, which is evaluated from 0 to infinity. So we have negative t to the z times e to the negative t. That is evaluated from 0 to infinity. When we evaluate that at infinity, again, we really are taking a limit as t approaches infinity. And then we have your uv term minus the integral of v du. There is already a minus, so we can write that as plus the integral from 0 to infinity of your terms here, z, t to the z minus 1, times e to the negative t. And if you evaluate your uv term at both 0, plug in t as 0, 
that goes to zero, take a limit as t goes to infinity, the exponential term decreases to zero. So this whole term is just zero. And for the final step of proving this property, which is true, and we're about to see it, notice here in this integral, t is the variable of integration, which means z is a constant. You can go ahead and pull this factor of z out front and write that as z times the integral from zero to infinity of t to the z minus one times e to the negative t. And if you refer back to the definition here of the gamma function of z, that is exactly this integral, which is the gamma function of z. And what we get here is exactly what we were trying to prove the gamma function of z plus one does equal z times the gamma function of z. And this property, that's going to allow us to find a lot of values for factorials of non-integer values. So let's just go ahead and write this down. The gamma function of z plus one equals z times the gamma function of z. All right, and this holds not only if z is a positive integer, but this property holds if z is actually a complex number. To fully understand that, that requires going a lot further in mathematics, but not too far. Some of you will be getting to that in your junior and senior level mathematics courses. Now with this property, let's go ahead and get to some interesting values for the gamma function. Now that we have this main property of the gamma function, we can start to use it to get some basic values. Now there's a basic value from the beginning of the video, the gamma function when z is one, and if you go back to the improper integral definition, when z is one, you'll get t to the zero, which is one, and then you're left with evaluating the improper integral of e to the negative t from zero to infinity. And it's very straightforward to show that comes out to positive one using the ideas that you learned in your Calculus two course. Now what's interesting about this calculation is if we flip it around, we'll be able to find the value for zero factorial. So first let's flip that around and write it as one equals the gamma function of one. To make use of this main property of the gamma function, let me rewrite the inside here as zero plus one. And how we use this main property of the gamma function is whenever we have the gamma function of a number plus one, here the number for z is zero, we can rewrite that as z or zero factorial. And here is the proof using the gamma function for why zero factorial equals one. All right, down below I have a link to the video I did on why zero factorial equals one that does not use the gamma function, so check that out. All right, up next, the gamma function for positive integers, but that's kind of boring. We saw that in the beginning. The gamma function of a positive integer is just the previous integers factorial. So the gamma function of n just equals n minus one factorial. So the gamma function for positive integers, they're just normal factorial values shifted back by one. All right, now the first real interesting value we're gonna get for the gamma function is when z is one half. So let's go to the improper integral definition and plug in z as a half. We'll get the gamma function of a half equals the integral from zero to infinity. If z is a half, you get t to the one half minus one power 
which is t to the negative one half, and that's being multiplied by e to the negative t. All right, first, let me rewrite that t to the negative one half power as one over square root of t. And from here, we're gonna use a basic substitution. Now the substitution is a little non-obvious, but we're gonna convert this into an integral that we already encountered. So the substitution we're gonna make here is u equals square root of t. And why this is helpful is let's rearrange this or rewrite that, square both sides, and we get u squared equals t. And what this substitution will allow me to do is convert e to the negative t into basically e to the negative u squared. All right, we're gonna need to calculate the differential here, the derivative of square root of t. And that comes out to one over two square root of t dt. And in the integral here, we have a one over square root of t factor and dt, but we're missing a two. So let me multiply that two in the denominator over to the du side. So we'll say two du equals one over square root of t dt. That's one piece we'll need for the conversion. u squared equals t is another. And one thing I like to do whenever I'm making a substitution when my integral has limits is convert or change my t limits to now limits for u. So originally our t limits are zero to infinity. And if we convert to u limits, first plug in t as zero, square root of zero is just zero. And for t being infinity, technically we should take a limit as t goes to infinity. And as t goes to infinity, square root of t also approaches infinity. So now if we use all three pieces here, t as u squared, our differential, and then our new limits, what we get is this integral converts. I'm gonna pull that factor of two out front this becomes two times the integral from now your new u limits, zero to infinity. The one over square root of t gets absorbed in your differential and your function e to the negative t converts to e to the negative u squared. And what we have here is the Gaussian integral which we evaluated in a previous video, which I have linked down below. That value for the Gaussian integral comes out to square root of pi. And this is an interesting value. This is the gamma function of a half. Comes out to square root of pi. And with that value, we can basically get the gamma function for any other integer plus a half. So let's go ahead and get to that. At this point, we now have everything we need to start finding the value of the gamma function and the factorial for half integer values. The two results we're gonna use are first the gamma function of a half, which we just derived and saw that comes out using the Gaussian integral to square root of pi. And the other result we're gonna use is this main property of the gamma function. So let's first start with finding the value of one half factorial. All right, we're basically gonna replace up there everywhere z with one half. So we get the gamma function of three halves, which we can think of as the gamma function of a half plus one. And we just make use of this property replacing z 
with a half, and that comes out to one half times the gamma function of one half. And we just plug in our value from what we found earlier. The gamma function of a half is square root of pi. So this comes out to a half times square root of pi, which you can write, of course, as square root of pi over two. And we're gonna think of square root of pi over two as one of two values. First, it's the value for the gamma function of three halves, but maybe a little more interestingly, it's the value for one half factorial. All right, let's go to the next half integer, three halves. So we'll evaluate three halves factorial. Replace everywhere up there, now z with three halves. So we're gonna get the gamma function of five halves equals the gamma function of three halves plus one. And you can probably see the pattern here. We make use of this property, now using z as three halves. So we get this comes out to three over two times the gamma function of three halves. And this is where the iterative property of factorials really shines and comes through because to evaluate the gamma function of five halves, it really just comes down to knowing the value of the previous gamma function value, which was three over two. So just plug in here, we get the value for the gamma function of five halves as three over two times now square root of pi over two. And of course you can simplify that to three times square root of pi over four. All right, let's go one more value to let's say five halves factorial. All right, and in that main property, we're gonna be using now z everywhere as five halves. So inside the first part here, we're gonna get five halves plus one. That's the gamma function of seven halves. We use that property to think of that as now being the gamma function of five halves plus one. And now we use that main result, the right-hand side of that property with z as five over two. And this comes out to be five over two times the gamma function of five over two. And we have right above the value for the gamma function of five halves three times square root of pi over four. And we just multiply that now by five halves. And you can simplify that. It looks like we're going to get 15 times square root of pi over eight. And what we see here for these values of the gamma function of half integers is they all seem to be proportional to square root of pi. And that is indeed true. That pattern holds for all half integer values of the gamma function. And what can be shown, but it's a little bit too long for this video, maybe a good topic for a future video is the gamma function of a half integer, so of the form one half plus n, where n is a positive integer, this comes out to two n factorial divided by four to the n times n factorial, and that is all multiplying square root of pi. So that pattern does hold the gamma function for half integer values. They are all proportional to square root of pi. And it comes out that constant of proportionality to involve factorials. 2n factorial divided by 4 to the n times n factorial. All right, and that is it. That's how we find the value for factorials of non-integer values. We need the gamma function and it gets rather complicated. Hope you enjoyed the video and all the different parts that we went through. If you did, support the channel. 
like, and subscribe.